first let me say I'm, I'm really, really delighted, really delighted to be here today. I understand that, I guess this is probably the first time DARPA's actually been invited to talk at one of these conferences. So I was actually surprised to hear that. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting discussion, let me put it this way. Um, the theme that you have for this week of NASA more than you imagine is something that I want to press to test. So let's, let's consider for just a moment. I, I went to the Air Force Test Pilot School 100 years ago, and you know, it's, it's one of those things when you're, when you're learning how to flight test airplanes, there's this thing that they do where they, they put a button on the console in the aircraft, and they put a little red label on it that says, press to test. And it's one of those things that you see, you kind of calibrate the pilots by, do they reach up and is that the first thing they do is press to test? Doesn't matter what it's going to do, and they don't care. It says press to test, so they push the button. Okay. Well, I'm going to do that today. You know, this, this concept of NASA more than you imagine, I'm going to really press to test. And if I haven't challenged you by the end of this conversation, then I'll be surprised. Uh, so I don't think anybody here has had a preview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about a lot of DOD systems. That's really not what I'm here to talk about today. We'll spend just a second before I get into this telling you about the Tactical Technology Office. Uh, we're the office that builds things within DARPA. So if you look at YouTube at all, if you've looked at one of the most popular videos on YouTube, it happens to be a quadruped robot called Big Dog. That actually came out of my office at TTO. We build airplanes. Um, we build satellites. We build uh, submarine-type vehicles. We build bombs. And we, we spend a lot of energy and a lot of time <coughs> excuse me, in the space arena. Well, it's a culture associated with DARPA. Pardon me while I wet my whistle here. It's a culture that's associated with DARPA that, that dates back to the very early days, right after the Sputnik launch. You know, DARPA and NASA have been intertwined for more than 50 years. DARPA came about right after the Sputnik launch and NASA very shortly thereafter. And this intertwining over the past 50 years has been both subtle, covert, overt, and, and sometimes successful and sometimes not successful. You know, for example, DARPA was involved with the very early days of engine development, taking the, the engines that ultimately became the engines for the Saturn launch vehicles, did some of the preliminary work on it, and then handed it off to NASA and became very successful, obviously, in the moon missions. DARPA has done some things that people are very familiar with, like getting credit for the Internet. Now, DARPA didn't actually invent the Internet. DARPA did the ARPANET, which was connectivity between educational computers and research institutions, connecting heterogeneous computers together. And what DARPA was involved with was that connectivity, the wired connectivity, and the creation of the protocols that actually let you communicate between one computer and another. Now, what was layered on top of that, of course, was ultimately the domain name system and TCP IP and the rest, which then ultimately became the Internet. So we get credit we get credit for the internet from that. One of the lesser known ones is that DARPA invented, well, DARPA didn't invent, DARPA had to have Blue Program, which ultimately led to all of the stealth technology that you have for airplanes today. And we've done other things along the way, like the fact that we have GPS today is because DARPA invested in the algorithms and the small satellites associated with doing timing on orbit and, and using that timing signal to provide position position referencing information on, on, uh, back on Earth. What's interesting about that is that it's what I call the, the fortunate consequences of research. That if you look through each one of these research programs, that there sometimes is an offshoot associated with the research that wasn't the intended consequence of the program itself. You know, so when DARPA started working on the engine programs, it wasn't that DARPA was trying to put a man on the moon. DARPA was never trying to put a man on the moon. But ultimately, that engine program became the engines for the Saturn launch vehicle. And when DARPA started the ARPANET, it wasn't intended for us to create the World Wide Web. That was an unintended consequence that was a fortunate consequence that came out of it. And the same with transit. You know, when we were looking at creating the algorithms and looking at the clock signals and stuff to put on orbit, it wasn't because we wanted to give everybody the ability to have one of these to be able to tell where they are when they're going from one place to another. That's a fortunate consequence of the DARPA research. What I like to actually look back on is, is the other side of the spectrum. How much of our research actually got spawned 
but things that we are exposed to in the art world, whether it be movies or books or television. I mean, how many of you out there bought your first Motorola StarTac phone because you grew up watching Captain Kirk talk on a communicator, okay? I mean, this is real. This is art becomes life. And, and I will tell you personally, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in the era where watching Stanley Kubrick and 2001 and David Bowen having a video teleconference with his kids, his wife and kids, on an electronic tablet on the table. And I dreamed of a day that that could happen. Today, my wife has an iPad where she iChats with me. Now, that's art becoming reality. And that's an important message here because it's going to lead to where I want to go to at the end of this conversation. It, not to be lost, of course, is the fact, and this is an important moniker for you to keep track of, 104 years from the time that Jules Verne wrote The Journey to the Moon, From Earth to the Moon, 104 years until we actually landed on the moon. Now, consider this for a moment. Jules Verne could not have created an organization, a funding path, a program plan, an IMS, or anything else that would have got us on the moon 100 years later. But he seeded the imagination of generations that followed that brought together all of the pieces that were necessary by the end of that 100 years so we were able to land on the moon. Hold that thought. There's a lot of other fortunate consequences that come out of space research. And, and I, don't wanna, I, I, I don't want anyone to ever underplay the importance of NASA in bringing to real life things that people take for granted today that came directly out of research that was spawned by NASA and the NASA space flight programs. I didn't know this until we were compiling this list. I didn't know that the baby food that I fed my kids was possible because of the work that NASA did on creating food sub substantive food for the astronaut corps. I did know, one that's not up here on the list, that when I go to Home Depot and I reach for the cordless electric drill, the reason I can do that is because NASA developed a technology to have cordless tools in space. So this is the fortunate and fortunate side consequences, the unintended consequences associated with the research as we go through time. So as you think about NASA more than your imagination, don't lose sight of the fact that everything you do may have an unintended consequence that has a positive effect way beyond the space flight itself. So, so what do we do about this in terms of challenges going forward? Today's a really hard time. You know, the budget cuts, the efficiency drills, the CRAs, this is a hard, hard time for everybody. But it's, it's actually much deeper than that. Quite frankly, the, the efficiency drills and the, and the cuts are not the part that worries me. The part that worries me is the way we have done our investments in space. The way we've gone off and built legacy organizations that have been around forever. The way we built legacy industries that have done things in a particular fashion forever. And if you actually look at some of the cost models associated with this, there's a really disturbing historical trend. And I won't try to have you pick apart this chart here, this, this eye chart. But this data is available. This is the stuff that we got out of, uh, uh, out of some RAND studies and some aerospace studies. The fact of the matter is, is that the space industry is changing. And if you look historically through what the U.S. has done versus the rest of the world, the U.S. is being left behind. And it's a very subtle thing. In the early days of space, the early days of space in the U.S., we built small satellites and we launched them frequently. But over time, we decided that it was more efficient to build bigger satellites and put more capabilities on them. And when we built bigger satellites, we had to have bigger launch vehicles. And it was a circle that got worse and worse. And so you, you build satellites today that are 500 million or a billion dollars, and they go on a launch vehicle that costs 300 or 400 or 500 million dollars to go. And if you have a mishap occurs, it's all gone in, in one blink of the eye, just like that. The rest of the world doesn't see it that way. The rest of the world couldn't afford to do that. The rest of the world couldn't afford to build 500, billion, 500 million or billion dollar satellites. So the trend is, for the 115 spacefaring nations other than the U.S., the trend is to build cheaper satellites, excuse me, less expensive satellites, and launch them on smaller, 
launch vehicles and have a more cost-effective solution at getting the same mission capabilities that we're able to do with these, these behemoths that we do. And this applies across the DOD as well as NASA. This is not endemic to either NASA or, or the, the DOD. I don't have necessarily a solution for this, but I, I put this out there for you to think about that the problem in this case is us, U.S., okay? The problem is us. We've done it to ourselves, and the only way we're going to change that is by changing ourselves. Now, another part of the problem. We now have 115 plus spacefaring nations. It's not the same as when there was just the U.S. and the Soviet Union. You have 115 plus spacefaring nations that are routinely operating in space and they're doing their livelihood based on space capabilities. It's putting an enormous amount of things in orbit. And so there's a shrill cry that's going up about, oh my gosh, there's debris up there, there's the possibility of conjunctions, it's a real issue, we need to clean up space, we need to go build these big vacuum cleaners and get rid of all the debris. And that's a, it is a shrill cry that's going on right now. We ran a study for the past year um, called Catcher's Med. And the conclusions that came out of that is that the shrill cry is unjustified. That if you actually look at the data, and if you look specifically right here, I don't know if you, you probably can't see the laser light, but if you look in this box that's blown up here, there's actually, as you've got the increase in nations and in going into space, there's been an interesting phenomenon that has occurred, and that is that it's a quality stewardship in the usage of space. The people are actually starting to take care of it themselves. And if you look at the actual numbers in terms of the number of residual objects that have gone on to orbit in the last 20 years, barring two events, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but barring those two events, the number of residual objects in the past 20 years has been almost level. And yet the total of mass that's been launched into orbit has been substantially increasing. So that stewardship is a really good thing. So the debris problem isn't we need to just go clean everything up. The debris problem is something that we work together on and solve by all of the spacefaring nations saying, look, we're going to act responsibly. We're going to clean up after ourselves. We're not going to jettison miscellaneous parts, and we're going, to, we're going to avoid conjunctions, intentional or unintentional. The two that are the major spikes that you see right there are, are clearly the Chinese ASAT incident and the Iridium Cosmos event. Both of those introduced a huge number of debris objects. That's very, very true. Some of those debris objects will naturally decay out of, of, uh, out of orbit. Now, the, the other conclusion out of the DARPA study on, on Ketcher's Met was that if you were actually to go forward and try to do something about debris, what would be the sensible thing to do? Does it make sense to make a vacuum cleaner and go sweep it out and, and grab up you know, objects that are down to pebble size? You know, a couple millimeters in size? Or does it make sense to go grab the big objects out of there? And what we found in running the models is that you're far better off if you were to just go and grab, say, five major objects a year, rocket bodies, you know, the, the detritus from putting something on orbit, the major bodies. Get five of those a year, and statistically, over time, you will bring down the number of objects in orbit of the debris objects, and you will also reduce the statistical probability of having conjunctions. So I know there's a number of folks in the audience that wonder if DARPA is going to go off and do a orbital debris cleanup program, because I get this call almost weekly. The answer is no, we're not. We're actually not going to, because of that conclusion, that that's not a DARPA hard problem. If you want to go clean up five objects a year, that's a space tug problem. Go put a space tug up there, go fly, go grab those, super sync them, or deorbit de them in, a, in a, uh, an appropriate fashion. So we're trying to play down the shrillness of this argument about orbital debris. Now, we're singing alone at this point in time, but we're trying to broadcast that this is not a problem that we all need to be panicked over. So now I'm going to shift gears completely and talk about what we are going to do and where we're going forward. And I'm going to talk about four subjects. And this is where I'm going to do the real press to test. So about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, Tom Khalil from the Office of Science and Technology Policy came over and talked to me at DARPA and said, you know what? The administration would really, really like it if we could encourage NASA and DARPA to work together 
and to try to instill some of the DARPA processes in the way we create, execute, and complete programs into the NASA processes. And so Tom Khalil introduced me to an individual that was shortly thereafter to become the head of the uh, Office of the Chief Technologist, Bobby Braun. So I met Bobby before he actually came to NASA. And Bobby and I sat around my office in Boston and we strategized about what's a way that we could encourage the thought processes that are sort of unique with DARPA into bringing them into to NASA. And the strategy we had was, was, was two. First, let's bring some NASA personnel into DARPA as pseudo DTLEs and make them effectively DARPA program managers. And then let's give those people a real task to go execute using DARPA processes, but under a constrained timeline. And so we came up with three studies. This is the first three that I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about the fourth one in a moment. And those studies were horizontal launch, manned geoservicing, and beamed energy propulsion. So we went through NASA. We did, Bobby Braun did a, a call throughout NASA, and they picked three of the finest individuals from NASA as program managers, and then they went through in a regular interview cycle at DARPA with the DARPA director, and the DARPA director said, yay, verily, you're qualified to be a DARPA program manager. And we brought them in, and we gave them the mandate, a million dollars from Bobby, a million dollars from me for each of these three studies, six million dollars total, and said, go off and create a program, and your requirement is, by the end of a year, we want you to come back and report to us with an investment strategy for each of these three areas. So the studies were to go back and to look at everything associated with it, to come back and say, here's what DARPA and or NASA should invest in in future years and the future POM cycles. These three studies are reporting out in April. So I've seen a preview of the Mangio servicing one, uh, and, and Bobby and I and, and Bill Gerstemeyer are going to see all three of these in about three weeks. And we're going to see those reported out, and then we're going to march forward into uh, plans going forward. So let me spend a couple minutes talking about each one of those. But before I do, I want to talk about the, the fourth one there. And this is the real press to test. A hundred year starship. Now you may have heard about this in the news and, and my, my good free friend uh, Pete Warden uh, one up to me in, in uh, sort of spilling the beans before we were ready to uh, go out and talk about this publicly. Uh, Pete has had to buy me several very nice bottles of wine as a result of that. Um, <laughs> We're not going to build a starship. Let me make that very clear. We're not going to build a starship. That's why I refer to Jules Verne and 100 years ago, 100 years before the moon landing, about him inspiring the kinds of thought processes that ultimately enabled us to go to the moon. And I'll, I'll come back to that in more detail at the end. But I do want to say, we're not going to build a starship. So the first of them is horizontal launch. Now this is not a new invention from DARPA. You know, I, I am the one that said to Bobby, let's go look at this, but it's not an invention saying, hey, we got a great new idea. It's a different view of looking at horizontal launch. If you look at this graph, if you can see it, there's a lot of different ways you could look at getting to orbit from a horizontal takeoff. And these have all been explored over the years, National Aerospace Plane Program, uh, you name it. There's a lot of DCX, there's a lot of variations on a the theme of getting to orbit from a horizontal takeoff. What DARPA is interested in is getting mass to orbit, lots of mass to orbit repeatedly. Not lots of mass necessarily at a time, but lots of mass to orbit over time. And we want to do that as cheaply and, and uh, routinely as possible. So the area on the graph that we're looking at is subsonic turbofan aircraft, traditional aircraft, taking off from a conventional runway and carrying a second and a third stage that would get the mass to orbit. Now, the constraints we put on the study from my perspective was, I want to be 100 miles circular orbit, I want it to be an equatorial orbit, and I want it to be from any conventional runway in the world to get to there. So no special infrastructure. That's, that's really key from my perspective. I want it to be as common as going to national and getting on US Air and flying to Charleston. I want it to be that commonplace. So the study has looked through the whole domain space, and they've looked at what could be done in the short term, what could be done in the long term, and this is a preview. This is not output from the study, but this is a preview of the space that they're looking at right now. And, and the sweet spot, from my perspective, is, is right in the middle. 
a subsonic carrier aircraft with an enhanced upper stage. And one of the very first things that people say is, well, we're going to make this a reusable platform in all rights. All the pieces need to be re reusable. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had to kick the tires and, and chastise the team and say, absolutely not. The takeoff aircraft from the runway should be reusable. Yeah, definitely. But we're not, and we're not talking about sending men to orbit, humans to orbit on this vehicle. We're talking about cargo. We're talking about mass. And I said, so when was the last time you saw a Delta IV Heavy come back to the launch pad? It's not a good thing if it does. <laughs> so you change the whole approach to design of a launch system if you apply the one word, reusable. It changes the entire trade space. And it actually costs you, my thesis is it costs you more than you gain. Now, I, I won't cite experience with shuttle program or anything else because the, the real issue, the fundamental issue is that it's always a matter of what assumptions you make. It's an assumptions that you make about flight rate, about the actual reusability, about the price of reusability and all those things. My contention is I want to put mass in orbit and I want to do it as fast as I can. I want to start soon and keep doing it repeatedly over and over and over. And the reason I want to do that is actually not for horizontal launch sake itself. It's actually for manned geoservicing. These are intimately tied together. Now, when I, used, when I created the term manned geoservicing, it was with deliberate malice of forethought. I want to attack the problem of servicing the literally billions of dollars worth of satellites that are at geosynchronous altitude. I want to use humans to do it with the best of robotics that are available. So it's not humans alone, but it's a combination of humans and robotics to go do that. But my ulterior motive here, and this is why, quite frankly, Bobby Braun bought into this, was that if I solve the problem of going to geosynchronous with a sustained human presence, if I can go back and forth routinely between LEO, between the Earth's surface, LEO, and geosynchronous altitude, and if I can survive and operate in the high radiation environment at geosynchronous, and I can do all the things associated with repair and maintenance and sustainment, I've solved 95% of the problems I need to solve to go beyond geo with human beings. 95% of the problems. To go to the moon, to go to Mars, or to go elsewhere. It's my contention, I will tell you it's my contention, but that's why Bobby brought into it. And, and interesting, I had, a, I had a heart to heart with Bill Gerstemeyer last Friday on this, and he told me very candidly, he's not here, right? So. <laughs> um, he, he told me very candidly, when I, when I created this study, he was adamantly against it. Absolutely adamantly against it. He could not see any value, this was a year ago, he could not see any value to exploiting a human operations at geosynchronous altitude. And I will tell you that when I talked to him on Friday, he said, I don't know that he used the word religious, but I would say he's almost become a religious zealot saying this is the right answer. This is the right answer. It's something that gives DARPA, NASA, the space community a tangible goal that has an actual return on investment. I mean, our vision of this is that this becomes a tripartite between DARPA providing technology, NASA providing human spaceflight expertise, and industry doing it as a for-profit business from day one, for-profit business, so that you could envision literally the creation of a refueling mission where you, you get an agreement with, with somebody who wants their satellite refueled, and you say for 10% of the price of your satellite, 10% of the price of your satellite will refuel it. Now, for somebody who's at end of life of their satellite and putting a couple hundred pounds of gas on it is going to give them another four or five years of life of that satellite, that 10% is in the noise level. Absolutely. It doesn't take too many of those 10% costs to add up to paying for it and making it profitable. So that's our vision, and that's what you're going to hear about in, in the near future. Now, we, we've looked at the trade space in terms of the technologies involved with it for Mangio servicing, and one of the things that surprised me that came out of this was there's actually a need for a non-human element of this right up front, and that's a robotic servicing spacecraft. 
And I pushed back really hard on the team and I said, okay, are you, are you just doing this? Are you blowing smoke or do you really need a robotic servicing element? And their contention was that there may be spacecraft that you don't want to go to to service, that you might want to move to a servicing location. And so if you had a capability with a robotic servicing spacecraft to go up and either do direct autonomous refueling or to grapple it and move it to a service, central servicing location, that would be a great first step. And so what, so what Bill Gerstemeyer and I shook hands on and Frank Seppelina on, on Friday was let's scope a program to do the very first vestiges of the manned geoservicing program as a robotic servicing mission. We'll take the DARPA friend arm, we'll, we'll look for a, a satellite bus, we'll look at rendezvous and prox op sensors, and we'll create a capability that can be done now, not 10 years from now. And we'll go do that very early. So this is a work in progress right now. We literally have a, a, a Skunk Works team between NASA and DARPA personnel going through and building a plan on this, and the idea is to go full speed ahead to go do an early demonstration of Mangeo as we're building a long-term program of what Mangeo servicing is all about. So the next one, the next one's beamed energy for propulsion. It's long been a, a dream of being able to do propulsion without carrying the propulsion system itself on the spacecraft. And so the crux of this study was looking at what are the elements that you could have off board that you could actually use to get small amounts of mass to orbit, or from one orbit to another once you're up there. Whether it be directed energy in terms of lasers or microwaves, the study's actually looking across the entire span of technologies from different types of beams, different types of vehicles, different types of internal uh, uh, propellants and that sort of thing, and, and how we could implement that system. So this is the third of the three studies that I'm doing with Bobby Braun, and as I say, all three of these conclude in the April time frame, and then we'll get projects rolling out of that. Now the last one, and this is my press to test, the last subject I'm going to talk about, 100-year starship study. So I grew up in the era of reading Arthur Clarke and Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov and Baer and Benford and Card and you name it. I mean, I, wet my, I, I, I cut my teeth on all of that science fiction. I watched the Gemini missions when I was in grade school on television. I wanted to be a part of something bigger than me my entire life in terms of the space business. Today, I look at my own kids, I look at my, my peers' kids, and I say, what do they have to dream about? No, no denigration or slur on Facebook or Google, but my kids' aspirations as computer scientists is to go join Google or Facebook. Not to go invent the future, but to go join Google or Facebook. Love them. I, I use both, okay? But, but that's not the same as when many of us here were kids, and all we could dream about was what can we do to either get to space or be part of space. Now, I don't have a grand vision that's equivalent to John F. Kennedy standing up and saying we're going to go to the moon. I don't pretend to be anywhere equivalent to that. But what I have tried to do here in creating this 100-year starship study was open the door to conversations about what's next. What's next beyond geo? What's next in terms of human endeavors and exploration? So we stood up this, stood up this study very parallel to what Robert Heinlein wrote about in, in his book, Time for the Stars, back in the 50s. And quite frankly, I suspect that was at the back of my mind when I, when I started this study. In Time for the Stars, Robert Heinlein posited an organization called the Long Range Foundation that whole theme was investing in research that nobody else would invest in and taking the profits from that research, pumping it back into the organization and becoming a self-supporting organization that was a long-term foundation. And they, in that foundation, funded interstellar spacecraft. And they then owned everything associated with interstellar flight. I won't say I have quite that grand of a vision, but what we're talking about here is trying to create some sort of an organization that's outside of the government that's not dependent upon the vagaries of government funding, that actually spawns and seeds research over 100 years. That's the key for the phrase of the 100-year starship. It's, it's 100 years that we would like to be the window that 100 years from now, like Jules Verne, 100 years from him, where you could say if somebody wanted to build a starship, everything they'd need would be there. So in January, on 1111, we held a workshop out at Kavala Point in San Francisco and brought together 29 visionaries. 
people like Joe Haldeman and Elizabeth Baer and Pete Gordon and uh, you know a, a number of, of folks, Craig Bentner, a, a number of folks from across the space industry, the the social sciences and and science fiction and, and a variety of folks, and we brainstormed about this subject for two days, with the idea being try to answer some of these questions, or at least posit the questions going forward that would help us on the study. You know, why would anybody want to go to the stars? Where would you go? Who would go to the stars? How would you fund this? What kind of research is necessary? So the 100 year Starship study is not about, let's go invest in the VASMR engine. It's about how do you create an entity that seeds research for 100 years that creates the right engine at the end of 100 years? or solves the long-term biological problem of long, long endurance space flight, or looks at the social impacts of what changes in the culture. If we discover a habitable world someplace else, what does that mean to the people back here? So the next steps on that is uh, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna release an, an RFI. It's gonna come out under a NASA uh, letterhead, but it'll be a joint DARPA NASA RFI. And we're going to be looking for inputs for folks that have ideas on the standing up of an organization that would carry this, carry this baton forward. The intent is that by the end of the study, by 11-11-11, by November of this year, that DARPA and NASA have stepped out of it. And that we have either been successful in convincing some entity to carry this forward, or we walk away. The entity that would carry it forward would be responsible for generating ideas, getting endowments, doing scholarships, doing grants, whatever is right along the way. So in, in support of that, we're going to have a major conference in the summer time frame, summer or fall time frame. We think it's probably going to be September, and it's going to be out at Ames. We're going to be looking for uh, papers across the entire spectrum of topics uh, to be submitted at this conference, things ranging from you know the exotics of physics, propulsion, to the, the less perhaps exotic of sociology, psychology, perhaps religion, anything associated with this topic area, if you're gonna to go to the stars, what, what are the effects associated with that? So I suspect that that's one of the places that a few of you here might wanna either submit papers to or participate in the fall time frame. And as I say, we're hoping by the end of, of this year that we will have established an organization that carries that vision forward. So that's my press to test, because when you say NASA more than your imagination, this is that kind of example. It's not about making better solar power for your satellite. It's not about a um, higher accuracy clock to put on your satellite. It's not about even you know, a better way of doing propellant for the, for the engines. You know, it's where do we really go here as the next step? And I think this is a logical partnership between DARPA and NASA on spaceflight and that there's lots and lots of opportunities going forward. Thank you. Are you able to take a few questions? Oh, please do that. Questions, please. Back there, first hand up by the door. Well, one of the, it actually it is being analyzed. Uh, you know, and, and you know, hearkening back to my Heinlein days, you know, those of you that actually read a lot of Heinlein remember that he had a launch site going out through Pikes Peak, you know, for uh, the, the minor problem that I see associated with it is that I need to end, I need to end the trajectory on the acceleration rail at seven kilometers a second. This has a minor perturbation to the atmosphere as it exits that rail and the entire ecosphere around it for like a couple thousand miles. So I don't think that everybody actually looks at the equations associated with it. If I've got an object traveling at that speed, that close to the ground, what are the implications associated with it? I'm, I'm, to, be, to be fair though, it is one of them that's in the bucket that's being evaluated. Well, that's an interesting point because MDA actually come, came and talked to me a couple times over the last year or so, and and I, I was never. Let me let me let me phrase this in a very delicate fashion. I think 
my desire is that this is a commercial profit-making industry. And I think MDA is setting a really, really excellent example by going forward to, to push the mission with Intelsat. I think that there's a logical marriage there. Details need to be worked out as we go forward. There's actually an RF, uh, I, I believe it's either an RFP that's been released by NASA or is about to be released from Goddard on this subject area. So, you know, this is a work in progress right now. I fervently believe this is where we've got to go, so it's just a matter of let's all get together and figure out how to do it. It's a, it's a very fair question. It's one of the first questions I get from most folks is that I put a million dollars into the study, and they say, what are you going to spend the million dollars on? And I say, well, I'm not going to spend it on research. And everybody says, well, that's really crazy. Why is DARPA doing that? And, and the problem is, is I think it's premature. I mean, not that those aren't great inspirations. I think those are great inspirations. But I think there's a whole slew of problems that need to be addressed, and we don't even know the scope of it. And let me give you a slight analogy, and I don't know if I've got more than about a couple of well, you got Okay, let me give you an, an analogy uh, or a metaphor. Um, in the early 1900s, Maxwell, Einstein, and Marconi all had all of the equations necessary that they could have described the performance of this. It was roughly 1900, 1905. Okay? There's absolutely nothing that you could have done in a conversation with Einstein or Marconi or Maxwell to say, give me an IMS, an integrated master schedule, that in 100 years I want every housewife, every kid, every husband to have a ubiquitous geolocation system and communication system in their pocket. There's nothing, even though they had all the equations to describe it right then, there's nothing they could have done to create a program to get to that point. And, and I, I tell this, this analog de deliberately because we are too naive to know what questions are going to be answered in the next hundred years. We don't even know which questions to ask in the next hundred years. And this is why I think the right answer is create some sort of, a, whether it's a foundation, organization, like it's a Nobel or a Rockefeller or whatever, create something where the whole purpose is enabling people to tackle problems that they think are worth tackling. And don't try to decide what those specific ones are today. So that's, that's my thing, and that's why I'm not spending the million dollars on research, I'm spending it on what kind of an organization can you set up to do this in the long term. Okay, that probably doesn't answer you completely, but. As I say, it's a, and it's, it almost becomes a religious debate because I do get this tug of war almost daily about we know what things we should be spending money on research on right now. I literally get about a proposal a day from somebody who's heard about 100-year starship about send me money to work on this engine concept. And, and I will tell you that, you know, this is possible because of DARPA investment in the early 80s on gallium arsenide. I mean, how many people realize that? The reason you can have this is actually, it's not just GPS, it's actually the semiconductor technology that DARPA invested in, and I will guarantee you that not one person at DARPA had the vision to think that when they invested in gall gallium arsenide that it was going to be the crucial element to give you the frequency response necessary to do this gigahertz level of radio communications. Just wasn't, didn't cross their minds. So, 
At this, by the same token, and I don't want to pick on this too much, but by the same token, if you'd asked Marconi to design this, it would have filled this entire room. He could have probably designed the radio parts of it on, on paper, but it would have filled this entire room based on the, on the availability and the knowledge of the technologies that were available at the time. So my pushback is that we need to be doing much more basic research. We need to be doing it at the fundamental level. Quite frankly, the people I'd like to target with, with the kinds of grants and scholarships are people in high school and college, not the people in industry, not the people that are tenured professors, the guys that are starting from scratch, that don't have any preconceived notion about what works and what doesn't work. What a great segue yeah. for a student's question. Okay. <laughs> I think that that's a, the first on, uh, on the second one first, I think that's a really good observation that there is a lot of mass on orbit today that could be reutilized. And I think that that's certainly a push that should be looked for. That's not really a DARPA problem, however. But I actually do agree completely that you could reutilize not just super sync things or deorbit them, but find a way to reutilize some of the mass that's there. Absolutely agree with that. On the first, on the first question, though, about elect, uh, tethers or other methods, as I mentioned, as a result of our catcher's mitt study, the reason we coined the phrase catcher's mitt was literally that's what we thought. We thought that would be the outcome, is that you want to create something like a catcher's mitt and just go around scooping stuff up and then deorbit it. And what we found is that the ROI, the costs associated with that, don't pay off. When you actually look at the orbital mechanics and the distribution of the debris, the actual energy expended in order to go to those orbits and do that collection far outweighs the actual risk implied by those specific pieces. Came to, which, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum of where we came to the conclusion of get rid of five major pieces a year, rocket bodies in that size, and you're way better off than you are worrying about the smaller pieces. Electromagnetic tethers, uh, electromagnetic tether is not going to work with a you know a, a 10,000 pound rocket body. It will use it will work with some of the smaller parts. So, and we're also not looking at dr directed energy concepts. There's a lot of folks that have come forward and said let's use lasers from the ground and and decelerate the objects as they're orbiting past and then they'll they'll degrade faster. We're not looking at any uh, uh, directed energy approaches to doing that. So, okay, okay, okay. Uh, up to you. Any other questions? Come on now, this is a very thought provoking discussion. Oh. Sorry, I just have a quick comment that uh, we were talking about before. There are certain orbits, though, about between 80 and 83 degrees that are about 900 kilometers, that you have like 150 identical Russian upper space bodies or more. So maybe focusing on uh, these areas would be more beneficial, developing like a similar technology to go to the same type of degree than just having a general catch vision and trying to run with a bunch of things. Uh, I, I think that's a reasonable suggestion. There are certainly orbits. There are some orbits that have more debris than others, uh, and there certainly is. There are places where that makes sense. Uh, as far as DARPA, we're not going to go pursue that. So. I guess I'll, I'll give you a question then, uh, and it ties into the 100-year Starship idea, which is, uh, have you thought about using a mechanism, and maybe this is part of what the response could be, but uh, like the X Prizes, where you're actually providing prizes for people to come up with new ideas to enable development of that capability. Well, and, and that's, part of, that's part of why in our RFI we're actually looking for organizations to suggest to us, you know, some entity would take this on, and whether it's XPRIZE, like XPRIZES, um, or do scholarships or grants or it's endowments, the idea being that you want it to be self-supporting. Yeah. In the long term, you want no government funding to be required in order to make this entity work. Uh, and that's how you keep it out of the, the fray of the kind of fray we're in right now in terms of the budget cycle. Uh, but beyond that, whether it's prizes, scholarships, one of the things that we've said that incentivizes people is the return on the dollar themselves. So the theory would be if you say you send a $5,000 scholarship to a, a, a master's degree student working on some exotic technique or something, and he creates something that's patentable and it produces revenue, 
Well, tie him into that revenue stream. Guarantee that he's going to get re re you know, compensation back for the research that he did. And there's one last point on that, and that is that thinking about the young kids in particular. The inspiration part of it is, you know, it doesn't always have to have an ROI that's direct. If you've got a, a high school kid in his garage that says, you know, i got this great idea for anti-gravity, and if you send me $500, I'm going to go buy some heat kit parts and pull it, put it together. If you give him that $500, it doesn't matter whether it works. He's going to spend the entire rest of his life dedicated to this problem. Okay? Okay? All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very, very much.